Hi everyone, welcome to episode four of BCG's Health Tech Videos. I am Arielle Rothman, and today's moderator is Sid Thekapat, Managing Director and Partner at BCGX. Today's panel will focus on health data business models. I'm excited to introduce our two panelists here today. Kat Miller is the CTO at Flatiron Health, and Sue Huing is the Head of Data Strategy at Datavant. Thank you both so much for joining, and I'll pass it off to Sid now to begin the discussion. Thank you so much for joining. One of the first questions that we had for you, given your depth in this topic, is what we're seeing is that healthcare data is increasingly being shared, and some of that is regulation-driven, so it's, a tre it's trending the right direction. Now, this leads to open questions in our mind, which is, are successful plays going to be aggregators? So very broad, pulling data from a variety of sources, or far more niche players focused on, for example, specific use cases or specific therapeutic areas. So with that context, I would love to hear, Kat, uh, your perspective on, on that. I think it's interesting because you sort of have one of each here. Um, the, the framework, I would say, is that raw data is necessary, but not sufficient. So the real question becomes, who is creating value from that data? So when you have data, how quickly can you get an answer? How correct is that answer? Flatiron got, made its success story from going really deep in oncology, and that's part of how we provided value from the data. There are going to be other stories where the volume of data is more important, but I think we need to really pay attention to the fact that aggregation it can be challenging. So for example, um, if you want to aggregate inpatient facilities with outpatient facilities, inpatient and facilities are encounter-based, outpatient facilities aren't. And so combining that data provides a challenge. So someone has to solve not just the like, did I get two data sets, but how did I put them together in a way that really genuinely makes sense at the end of the day? Sue, so I'd also love to hear your perspective because you're spending very little time at data went also helping our clients like stitch together various data sets? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's opportunity for both types of players. Um, these data can be relevant for different kinds of research objectives. Um, I think historically you've seen aggregators focus on aggregating data in a single data type, whether it's prescription data or claims data. And this kind of aggregated large comprehensive data set is still foundational for many use cases like patient journey um, analysis um, and especially relevant for patient journey analysis in diseases that are as yet poorly understood. So you really need to bring all of that data together and analyze them for patterns to better understand the disease state and the diagnostic odyssey for patients. Um, but there's also a place, especially now, where there are a lot more aggregated data sets for more niche specialized players to come along that specialize in a particular disease area, such as oncology or rheumatic conditions. Um, I haven't seen data users say like, I only want the aggregated data set or the niche data set. I've increasingly see, uh, seen data users come and say, we want both. We need a really good niche, deep data set and a very comprehensive, large aggregated data set. Um, and I think the ask for the data aggregators from life science clients is always that we want more completeness of coverage across many patients. And the ask for specialized data companies is we want more granularity of the data elements and oftentimes custom abstraction capabilities to very precise needs. So I think there's room to uh, play for both types of uh, data business models. Um, but given the number of data aggregators out there already, there is there is a lot of unmet need and new demands for those niche specialized players. And I think that's where we have seen the largest growth in the health data ecosystem of new um, data companies coming in and, and making a mark for themselves in, is in these more specialized niche uh, data areas. I, I think you're both right that there's this place for both and the answer obviously also varies by therapeutic area, et cetera. And so like, we're all aware of that. What we're sensing also is when we work with our clients and we run RFPs and try to understand data sources, increasingly when we look at samples, we're finding like some niche vendors will have specific fields or structured data that others don't. And that is the level of, I guess, the bar that our clients are trying to look at as well. So I, I know I personally think it's just a very exciting time if you are a PA needs specific players because our clients are also going up the sophistication curve and demanding that. Um, but thank you so much. My next question, and so this is like a hot button topic for everyone, it's Gen AI related, no surprise. 
we think there's just going to be an increased focus on unstructured data, given the general excitement in this space, right? So, you know, pharma firms said all this while we're procuring structured or semi-structured data might want to, for example, train a structured patient notes, for example, obviously anonymized. There are open questions then on who should and will the various layers of the stack to process and drive value from this unstructured data. And so Kat, given your like CTO hat, I'd love your perspective on this question. I mean, I think it's a really hard time to answer this question because I think, think we're still learning about the fundamental technologies. So for example, how much can you do with fine tuning versus how much do you actually need to train a model on a specific data set and for which applications? So the more that LLMs need to, for example, be trained, you know, soup to nuts on a particular data set, the more you're going to see an end-to-end -end play where whoever needs to use the model needs to train the model, and, and that will create a certain kind of environment. And the more you can do more with fine tuning and use an off-the-shelf model, the more you're going to see sort of horizontal players in the space. I do think that I, from my own experience, just working with these right now, you know, we have a bias towards wanting to work in the ecosystems we're already in. So that's, you know, the AWSs and the Azures of the world. Um, so I think there's a natural advantage if they can get things up to snuff. The question in my mind is how differentiated will LLMs be at the end of the day? And will we be able to pick based on just the ecosystem we want or the cost point we want? Or are we going to need to be able to use a, a wide variety of vendors for different use cases? Agree with you there and that the cloud vendors are very well positioned. Maybe to turn it over to you, Sue, our, my hypothesis is that there's just going to be a lot more interest in, for example, patient level unstructured data. And I'm curious how you see that landscape evolving over the next few years. Like, who will be those providers of unstructured data? Yeah, I mean, I think you're already starting to see that now where um, healthcare organizations like hospital systems, for instance, that have historically um, you know, had their data siloed within their four walls are collaborating increasingly because there are now tools available to make sense of all of this unstructured data. Um, there are a number of different distributed data networks out there now between collaborations across different health systems where they are, you know, coming together, um, creating large language models on top of unstructured data that they see, continuing to add data point from new patients that enter the system into that database um, and really taking the clinical expertise that they have and the data that they have and um, adjusting a lot of the general large language models and fine tuning it for the precise um, disease states that they are looking to answer questions in. We see companies in the ecosystem that are, are collaborating in this way with the data. And then we also see companies in our, um, in our customer base that are uh, taking uh, general large language models and really um, utilizing that very specific healthcare data to, to retrain that models and fine tune it for very specific applications. So I do think a lot of this needs to come from companies that have healthcare expertise and have the clinical staff uh, within their company to make sense of all of this data because a lot of this data is really messy in raw form, needs to be cleaned and prepped and structured into, into a usable format such that the large language models can even be applied to it. So I think a lot of this will be a collaboration between the big tech companies and healthcare um, uh, companies with healthcare domain expertise. So my take based on my limited read so far is on in terms of the tech stack itself, while we think the cloud vendors are very well positioned, the reality is like there is just new technology to be implemented. The second thing that we're seeing is already our large life sciences clients are talking about bringing their own proprietary data to the extent they can into the tuning level. So those there's a probably a couple of like sub layers within the stack that we think that it may not be necessarily like the cloud vendors. It may be other players that have an opportunity to bring that, right? Including like the data vendors themselves of like, how do you feel in like the proprietary data to the tuning? On the unstructured data piece, agree with you fully there, Sue. Our, I, I think the our, our perspective is sometimes when we work with data vendors, they claim to have semi-structured data, but the data is very messy and structured. And so we're just excited now that we'll be able to apply tech to actually like drive value from it for, for these large pharma codes. Um, awesome. 
And my last question here, and maybe I'll uh, start with you, Sue, first, is our life sciences customers are now just going up the curve in terms of like building up their own data science capabilities, right? As, as you all know. And now having said that, they also feel like face like a heavy burden of customization based on use cases or therapeutic areas. So as they try to create value and you being like, you know, their data partners, how much are you thinking about investing in productizing solutions to address their needs versus driving them through like a more custom services there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, um, at DataVant, we're focused on helping to uh, provide technology that um, connects uh, different data silos together because, um, you know, even as uh, more powerful analysis capabilities come in, they all rely on large data sets that are representative, unbiased. Um, you know, the model is only as good as the data that feeds into it. So um, as a technology focused company that um, works with a lot of life science companies to help them navigate this growing and ever um, complex data ecosystem that we have, um, our first instinct is always to think about what products we can build to address the customer's need. Um, but in order to understand the customer pain points and needs and even to know what product to build, there's often some manual service-based work that goes into fulfilling that customer need first, right? So one of the uh, things that we have seen a need from um, is better tools to assess data sets and understand the different data partners that are available out there now. Um, and early um, in uh, data advanced history, we used to get a lot of life science questions about how to vet the landscape. And a lot of that was a manual matchmaking process. Like what data do you need? What research question are you trying to answer? And then try to navigate to the providers that can fit those needs. And over time we've invested in products um, such as building out a web portal with an online database of companies that have certain data capabilities, building out partner exploration tools, data assessment tools, and really reducing the amount of time it takes to navigate the data ecosystem and find fitting partners. So we always take a product centric lens, but a lot of that initial work will be service based um, so that we know like what products to to build to to make that process less manual over time and more frictionless for our customers. And that makes a logical sense and also what we would advise like our software clients to do. Uh, I'm curious, Kat, uh, you know, you've been at Flatiron through the early days and like probably seen this journey. Where has that approach worked well versus not like any of reflections? Yeah, I, I was going to say it's it's very one of the things that's really cool about having been in the, this space for the last 10 years is to see customers getting more expansive and sophisticated. And so in some ways, we started with a one size fits all solution. And, you know, for the last nine and a half years have been pushed to go increasingly customized in the solutions as, as our customers um, come up with more and more things that they can do. And so I've definitely felt that push towards that more um, customized solution. We have started to double down on services within Flatiron actually, because it is so important to, first of all, enable your customer to actually answer the question through any means necessary. So if that means services, it, it means services. I think that that's not the end of the story. And I think Sue alluded to this as well, which is that you, that's not a scalable solution. It's not scalable for them and it's not scalable for us. It's not the cheapest possible way at the end of the day. So you need to be close to the customer in order to be able to start building out that platform level solution. And so I think this is another one that's that's yes and. You, you need services and you need to be able to leverage those services to ultimately create a more scalable and cheaper solution for people to be able to solve their own problems. 